maybe there's a reason why you're still here. And I went and prayed. I asked. I went back to the scene of the accident and asked, am I really supposed to write a book? I didn't get a thundering answer that said, write a book. But I did get that voice that speaks to your heart in a very powerful way. What I was told was, share your experience and others will heal. This is In Good Faith, listening to first-person experiences of faith and belief. On In Good Faith, it's our privilege to hear stories and accounts from believers told in their own words. Our hope is to listen with an open heart, celebrating the power of faith and belief and what those stories mean to the ones who tell them. I'm speaking in good faith today with Jeffrey Olson. Jeff, I have looked forward to this for actually almost a year since I read your book, Knowing. Thank you for coming in. Oh, gosh, it's an honor, Steve. It's good to be with you. Jeff is the creative director at BYU Broadcasting, also a best-selling author. I'm holding his book, Knowing, Memoirs of a Journey Beyond the Veil and Choosing Joy After Tragic Loss which, by the way, has a very beautiful cover. It makes me feel good. Just, oh, it's a beautiful photo. <laughs> just I, looking at that. I love nature, and any picture of nature to me is divine. So, yeah, I selected the cover for a very specific reason. Mm. It's interesting. I mean, if you look at it, there's two little white flowers. Right in, in the front. lower. Yeah. yeah. Those are my two angels. As we get into this, you'll realize why. But, yeah, those represent my two angels that I uh, see in everything, whether it's flowers or a sunset or anything I look at. There's, uh, there's always a hint. Oh, I love knowing that. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, obviously, we'll speak a, a bit about Jeff's visit to another realm in a spiritual sense. But I want to first start off by just asking, what kind of religious upbringing did you have? How do you remember church or God or any of that being a part of your life? Oh, yeah. I, I was brought up in a conservative Christian home and went to church. But the interesting thing is my mother and father divorced when I was very young. I was about four years old. And my father became disassociated with church. And I would spend weekends with my dad and then weekdays with my mom. And so I had a very religious schedule with mom. You know, I would go to the children's groups and the the groups uh, during the week. But then when I was with dad, we were on the farm and it was hard work. And my father, although he had disassociated with religion. And he he later in life, my father's still living, he's 85, and now he's a very religious man. But at the time, he was about honesty and about Mm -hmm. integrity. And he taught us these deep-seated values on the farm outside of church. In fact, he would often say, you know what? Even the trees have a spirit. Even the mountain has a spirit. You connect that way. And we had a lot of animals. And uh, he taught us about stewardship through uh, heartbeats. He would say, you've got 125 heartbeats out there to take care of every day. And so my father, I I honor my dad, a a great man, and my mother, she's like an angel, the most compassionate, kind, loving person I know. So I had a religious upbringing, and I would go to church. I would sit in the church pews and and was very familiar with uh, Scripture, and yet I was probably always a seeker. You know, as a teenager, it's like, well, but what's really real? And I would lay out and look at the stars and think, gosh, there must be more to it than than everything I'm told. And... uh, this whole journey was probably a journey to go within and finally realize my own answers outside of what anybody told me. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Did you have moments where you thought, well, this seems like a God moment, things that made you believe, or was it still always, I've been taught this, I'm still looking? Um, No, no, I had many God moments, uh, even as a young child. And I think a lot of, you know, the divorce was traumatic. My my parents were great. They always loved us and they did a great job of co-parenting. And they were always very respectful of each other. But I think it caused insecurities in me, Mm. you know, where I was always looking for what's real, what's true, because what was meant to be true and forever and always suddenly wasn't. But I had many God moments, and, and, and some of them were out in the fields under the stars, or it may have been in church, or I had incredible teachers, um, whether that was in church or out of church. I, I played a lot of athletics, and I think some of my coaches may have been some of the instrumental people in really uh, bringing a God moment. You know, I might have been on the football field, and it's like, wow, that rings true to me. Hmm. In the book, you talk about driving with Mm -hmm. your family, you have an accident, and almost immediately you've lost your wife, one of your sons. You're conscious enough to know about all of that. That's pretty devastating. It was the darkest moment I've, I've known in many ways. Gosh, I went to college. In fact, I was, I was playing football at Utah State up in the northern part of Utah. 
fell madly in love with an incredible person. We got married, we had children, and we were on a family vacation, actually. It was the Easter weekend, and we'd gone Mm. to see my wife's folks. And it was an incredible weekend. Our oldest son, Spencer, was seven years old, and he was, you know, in that magic time of life when everything is still new and the awe and wonder of a little boy. And then our youngest, Griffin, was 14 months old. He was just learning to walk you know, and just saying his first little words. We were a very happy, happy family. I'll never forget the Easter morning, you know, when the kids ran out. And and Griffin, uh, we have a tradition of we would hard boil eggs, and then Mm -hmm. we would put them in colored dye and take them out in the yard and the garden and hide the eggs. And Griffin, our toddler, was just learning to walk, and he would go pick up an egg, you know, and he would... (laughs) take a few steps, fall down, crawl with the egg, you know, come up to me and he's slobbering as toddlers do and he'd hold up the egg. He thought they were balls. He would say, dad, ball. He could just Mm -hmm. say little words like that, but that'll be engraven into my heart forevermore, this delightful little boy and what Easter morning was like for him. But that was the, the setting and it was the day after Easter that the accident happened. That was incredible. I mean, there's moments of that, and it's always in hindsight, you know, there's Mm -hmm. moments about it in hindsight that will always be with me. I remember leaving the house. We had packed everybody up and we were leaving to come back home and Tamara, my wife, had jumped in the car and grandma and grandpa, you know, her parents were on the porch waving like they do. And I was just getting ready to pull away from the curb and she said, Jeff, wait just a minute. I want to go say goodbye to mom and dad one more time which at the time I thought, oh, come on, you know, women, you know, we, <laughs> we, we just got the kids strapped in. <laughs> yeah, I just got everybody in. We're on our way. I got to get back home. I've got work waiting. And anyway, but I put the car in park and I watched and I noticed as she ran up to the porch and she not only hugged them, but she kissed them both, which wasn't uncommon, but I noticed it. You know, I noticed her hug and kiss her mom and dad and joyfully come running back to the car. And of course I put it in drive and, you know, hit the interstate and cranked it up on the cruise control as fast as I could go. But but I bring that up because that moment, I think we all get these whispers. You know, that's what I call it, the whisper. I'm just going to go say goodbye to mom and dad one more time. And in this case, that, that was the last goodbye. I mean, we had no idea, but that, that little feeling, that little intuition, that inspiration she got of, maybe I'll just jump out and go hugging them, kiss them and, and do that. Which I'm uh, sure is something that has stuck in their memory. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's part of uh, everybody's way. It, it's almost like, gosh, did she know? She had no idea. But as the day played out, yeah, that was a, a pretty interesting moment. Some people who have had near-death experiences, whether in an operating room, in an accident, talk about seeing the accident, all of all of that, and being able to describe what happened. It was a single car rollover. You know, there was reports of heavy crosswinds. There was reports of a pickup truck that was driving erratically on the interstate. But, you know, Steve, the hardest part of the story is I believe what happened is I just dozed off at the wheel. Mm. I not, not even fell asleep, but just nodded off and swerved to the right and then overcorrected the car and, and lost control. And it began to roll not not off the road, but down the road. And I had the cruise control at 75 miles an hour. So it was a high speed horrific automobile accident. They, I was told the, by the accident reports, the car probably rolled no less than six to eight times. Mm. I blacked out for a lot of that. But uh, when the car came to a stop, um, I was completely conscious. I mean, I, the first thing I heard was Spencer, my seven-year-old, crying in the back seat. And yet as a father, it was that cry. I'm like, oh, he's okay. I've got to get to my son. You yeah, know, it was, yeah. it was that type of a cry. And yet that's when I realized that I could not move. I was pinned either to the floorboard or the, or the seat. I couldn't tell. There was the rancid smell of gasoline. There was the broken glass everywhere. I was unaware of my injuries in that moment. I mean, I knew I was struggling to breathe. I knew there was pain. But what had happened is both of my legs had been crushed. Uh, my left leg was eventually amputated above the knee because of the injury. My back had been broken. My rib cage had been damaged. My lungs were collapsing. My right arm had almost been torn off. It was completely out of socket. The entire rotator cuff was detached. And then the seat belt had cut through me and ruptured all my intestines. Oh, wow. So I was in rough, rough shape, unaware of any of that. I just knew my son was crying and I wanted to get to my son. But as you, uh, as you mentioned, that's when the brutal reality hit that nobody else was crying. And um, mm. 
I couldn't even talk about this for years. I mean, it's been over 20 years now. I can talk about this without falling apart. But what, what had happened is Griffin, our little toddler, his car seat had broken apart. And I was aware of the fact that he had been ejected from the car. And as a father, it's just like, where's my little boy? I mean, what happened? And it's, it's almost as if spirit told me he's, he's gone. I knew at the scene that he was gone, mm-hmm. which in some ways may have been a relief. And yet in other ways, it was the most horrific thought or thing I could fathom. And then Tamara, who was sitting next to me, she had reclined her seat during our trip, and she had fallen sound asleep. But because she had reclined her seat, the seat belt had not restrained her properly. And I'm not sharing these details to be morbid or graphic, but she had suffered some pretty severe head trauma, which which took her life. They were both killed instantly at the scene. It was horrible. I mean, here I am. I can't move. I've got a hysterical seven-year-old. I know half the family's gone and the guilt, I was driving the car, you know, what happened? Yeah. It was like, can't I turn this back three seconds and, and take it all back? It was, it was the darkest, darkest moment I'll ever encounter, I think. In that darkest, darkest moment, I'm losing consciousness and suddenly everything becomes calm. And it felt like light came. I mean, words are sometimes difficult. It felt like light came and began to comfort me, like it surrounded me in this bubble of light in this darkest, darkest moment, which is why I shared, you know, some of those details. And yet I, I began to feel as if I was rising above the scene of the accident. And my thought was, gosh, I'm okay. I can breathe. The pain's gone. How, how can I be okay? It didn't make any sense. And yet I had been a believer, but I, I was not aware of, wow, I believe what happened is my spirit had left my body. I was suddenly free from all that trauma and all that, you know, chaos of the accident. And yet the interesting thing is, as I was in that bubble of light, if you will, Tamara came to me. She was right there with me and she was absolutely gorgeous. I mean, I, th- this is why I share the details. She, there was no injury. There was no trauma. She was absolutely radiant. And yet she was so emphatic that I had to go back. Jeff, you can't come. You've got to go back. You've got to go back. And um, we had a very interesting conversation about choice. You know, I, I learned that that was choice. I, I, could, I could stay or I could choose to go back. And here I was looking at the woman I loved more than life. And yet I had a little boy in the back seat of that car. And I made a choice. And the choice was to come back. And, and I, I did and come he, back. And he was the reason. He was the reason. I mean, he was the reason. And Spencer, at age seven, he was banged up a little bit in the accident, but he basically walked away from the crash physically. Emotionally, he thought the whole family was gone. And, uh, of course, with my injuries, I, I wasn't aware of any of this. They had to extricate me from the car. I was life-flighted to a level one trauma center. I was unaware of any of that. I had wrecked the car. I was aware of that. I had said the most profound goodbye I would ever say. And as I chose to come back, I found myself wandering around the hospital, which I thought was kind of odd too, but, <laughs> but there I was. And, um, and it was, and that was an incredible, it was incredible because I was moving about freely and there was the doctors and the nurses and the patients and the families of the, of the patients. And I was aware of everything that was going on, but I don't know if anyone else was aware of me. And I was, I was seeing all these people, these clinicians and patients, and, and yet I was seeing them at such a profound level. Everyone I saw, I knew them perfectly. In fact, I, I loved them. It's like I, I saw their life. I was aware of their love, their hate, their motivations, their joys, their challenges. I, but I was feeling them as, as if they were me. I call it this oneness. They were me. I was them. And there was this connection. In fact, uh, it didn't matter who they were or what they had done or what they hadn't done. There was this absolute intense love. And having grown up in a conservative Christian home, a, a Bible verse came to me very powerfully, which was the famous verse where Jesus said, in as much as you've done it unto the least of them, you've done it unto me, which I used to believe was a really nice verse about being nice. Uh-huh. But there was a whole deeper level. Suddenly I was experiencing them as if they were me. And I thought, Wow. What the master meant is I am the man in prison. I am the naked beggar on the street. I am the stranger that— I feel that. 
yeah, I am them, they are me, we are one. And I was experiencing this intense oneness at a much different level than compassion. It was actually connection. It's like, wow, now I get it. And, and there was this intense love, uh, you know, everything from the heroin addict to the saintly grandmother. It's like, look at the beauty of their existence. Look at their path they've chosen to walk and, and what it does to expand their soul and therefore it expands all of our souls. It was, a, it was an incredible experience. As you're recovering, and this had to have been a painful, physically a painful recovery, as well as the emotional things, how did that help having had that contact and those understandings? It was interesting. It assisted in a way that I knew, wow, there is no death. If I go, I guess I go back to that beautiful realm of love. Um, but there was also this greater motivation to love. I mean, you know, doctors and nurses had come in the room, and it's like the door didn't shut all the way to that other realm. I could feel the vibration, if you will, of, of, of where they were emotionally and spiritually. And, you know, someone would come in the room, and you would feel such an intense amount of compassion for me. I mean, it was, it really did peel things back. I think the bottom line is judgments and comparisons just went out the window. Yeah. I think I'd been judgmental in my life up to that point. Like, well, they've made their own bed and they're in that situation because they did this or something was bad or wrong. And, and suddenly I saw things with far more love and far more acceptance and compassion, realizing that we're all on our own journey, and, and I had no place to judge anyone's. Is that what you mean? In the book, you talk about, you call it a download yeah. of information or knowledge or wisdom or something. Could you talk about that? Yeah, I call it a download because that's what it felt like. It was like, <laughs> boom, I, I, oh, I've got this, this knowledge, this, this insight, and yet it almost felt more like remembering than learning it's like, oh, I, I remember this. I've, I've always known this. I just didn't know that I knew. And mm -hmm. now I know that I know. And, and so it, it, they were incredible. And yet I don't dismiss the divine from that at all. I think and felt as if I was being tutored by a very divine source to get me through the catastrophe and to see things in, in a much different light. You have, besides writing about this experience, you've been asked to speak at different conferences, to talk about the concepts. Did you feel at the beginning some sort of mission to share what you learned, or is that something that came later? No, I, it came later. I, I didn't want to talk about it. I, I didn't talk about my experience. Only my immediate family really knew. I mean, mm -hmm. I told my mother and my brothers, and certainly I shared some of the things with my son, Spencer, to comfort him. But I didn't talk about it openly. I didn't care to. There was a, a lot of different reasons. It was sacred to me. It's like, I don't, this isn't lunchtime conversation. You <laughs> sit and say, hey, I, you know, but later on, I was teaching a Sunday school class on a Sunday morning. There was a, a theme of the love of God. And, and I just, I fell apart. I couldn't teach the class. The tears were rolling. Mm. And one of our neighbors and a woman in the congregation came up and she said, something happened to you, didn't it? I said, well, yes, but I don't talk about it. And she came over later that day, and I shared a little bit about what had happened to me being out of the body. And, and there was much more. I had other experiences in that realm during those long six months of the hospital stay. But she encouraged me to talk to a friend of hers who studied this near-death experience or out-of-body experience. And I reluctantly agreed. He, he studied all the commonalities or differences. Do belief systems influence that? So he was looking at it from a very clinical standpoint, but I shared my experience with him. And he said, you've got to talk to our group. You know, you've got to come speak. to." I'm, I'm like, no, I don't talk about this publicly. And he said, well, look, people are grieving. Some of them are in late stage cancer. You know, they've had loved ones pass. I mean, what you have to share may as assist them in some way. So I agreed to do it. And to make a very long story short, there was a publisher in the audience who came up and said, you're going to write a book. And I'm like, no, I'm not <laughs> going to write a book. I barely talk about this. And of course, I'm cry miserably when I talk about some of these things. And that was a Friday. On that following Monday, I had a contract in my email to write a book and it frightened me a little bit. But there was that little whisper again that I call it that said, maybe you should consider this. Maybe there's a reason why you're still here. Hmm. And I went and prayed. I asked. I went back to the scene of the accident and asked, am I really supposed to write a book? Now, I didn't get a thundering answer that said, write a book. But I did get that voice that speaks to your heart in a very powerful way. And when it speaks to me that way, I can quote what I was told. What I was told was, share your experience and others will heal. 
Now, this was uh, 10 years after the accident. So a decade had gone by, but I thought, wow, I've done some healing. If it's not about me, if others could heal, maybe I'll, I'll write a book. I dove in and I figured my mother would buy a copy. You know, I mean, what do I have? But, I've sold one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, <laughs> it hit number three on Amazon in the category in the first 10 days. And suddenly, yeah, I was getting requests to come speak about it all over the world. And yet to do that, if I can honor, if I can make something good out of a drastic situation, then that brings healing not only to others, but to me too. When you speak and people come up to you one-on-one, is there something that they most often ask you? Yeah, yeah, there's a few things, actually. A lot of them will say, do you still feel people that way? Mm. Do you still, you know, do you still sense their lives and see them in their magnificence? And and the, the honest answer is not every day. No, you know, I mean, but there are those moments when, yeah, that veil, as I call it, lifts. I, I was leaving work one day and there was, uh, in fact, I'd taken the bus to work and I remarried. I fell in love again. I mean, years have gone by, but there was this homeless man as I left the office and Tanya, my current wife, had come to pick me up. It was our date night, and this homeless guy's asking me for money, and I'm like, look, I got to go, and and suddenly something just said, look at him. Just look at him. And I looked, and that thing lifted. You know, suddenly I saw the magnificence of his of his soul, and I realized, wow, that could be me. You know, if I hadn't had family support, I might have been the guy strung out on yeah. some street corner, and I... And, and there was this huge amount of compassion to the point that I, I don't even know what came over me, but I threw my arms around him and just hugged him. And I just hugged him and he started to cry and I started to cry. And, and the crazy thing is, is um, and it's almost like my mouth said it before I could think about it, as I, as I hailed him and two grown men stood in the streets and wept, I said, I know who you are. And he said to me, I know that you know. And suddenly everything, you know, everything was, Mm. I'd have given him everything in my wallet and suddenly the money wasn't important to him. I think it was just the connection of being realized. So yeah, every now and then that comes and people have asked me about that. You know, often people ask who have lost, who are grieving, you know, does the pain ever go away? Do you ever, Mm. how how did you get over this? And I, I always say, I never, I'll never get over it, but I've gotten used to it. And I'm at a point now where I can say I've learned things I would have learned in no other way. It's expanded my soul in ways that probably would have never happened had we not had the accident and had all that took place. In your subtitle, you say Memoirs of a Journey Beyond the Veil and Choosing Joy After Tragic Lost. How do you choose? Well, What is that choice? <laughs> I've learned in my experience For me, there's only one cosmic law, and it's free will and choice. We get to choose. That's how much the universe loves us and supports us. We get to choose. And and it came to me in an interesting way. This was years after the accident. I was fitted with a prosthetic. I had learned to walk. I was using a cane. I was back at work. And I was angry with Tamara, my wife, for leaving. You know, I mean, it's like I, I was actually at the gravesite one day, hunched over, sobbing into the grass, And it was like, how dare you? How could you go? Here I am. I can't even walk right. I'm trying to raise our son. And I was letting her have it. And I swear she came to me. I I don't see, you know, people, Mm -hmm. but but I felt her. Her presence was right there as if her hands were on my shoulder. And she said to me, I loved you enough to go. And I'm like, what? That makes it. You loved me enough to go. And she had this communication or download, if you will, she said, look, we had an agreement. You would not be learning what you're learning had I not left. I would have loved nothing more than to stay and grow old with you, but our souls had a greater journey, and I loved you enough to go that you would learn and have this experience. So don't berate me for loving you enough. Mm. You know, it's like the whole universe had conspired for me to to grow. And, And it was interesting because she told me in that essence to choose joy to please make that choice because that my grief was in some ways holding her in grief. She could only be as happy as I was because even though she had passed on, we were still connected and that she wanted me to choose joy. And, um, you know, that was the catalyst really for me opening up. I never really dated or, or looked, but Tanya, my current wife, came into our lives shortly after that in such a way that she was a gift. And she's she's the hero of the story, you know? I mean, she not only agreed to be my wife, but agreed to be Spencer's mother and came from a completely different culture, a completely different belief system. 
And yet we found this common ground in, in deep spirituality and deep love that worked. And we, you know, we eventually adopted two boys and recreated a family. And she's been the hero that's put all the pieces together or put up with me while I attempted <laughs> to put all my own pieces together. So it's an incredible uh, way that it's all rolled out. It's, I mean, it's all in the book Knowing, which... Um, it covers not only the near-death experience, but probably more importantly, the life experience. Like, what do we do, you know, yeah. in life regardless well, of You that. talked about this uh, anger about circumstance. But in the book, you talk about from I, what I guess I will call the other side, yeah. continuation of seeing that differently, that maybe we even had some hand in designing our lives. Yeah. Even the things we might be most irritated. Oh, please tell me about that. Well, and that came in a very profound way. And I'll share this. It's it's a bit of a long answer. But at the end of my hospital stay, and it might be significant to point out, the two most profound experiences were at the scene of the accident, you know, before all the narcotics had been administered. And then at the end of my hospital stay, when I was off of all the narcotics, I was out of ICU, I had gone through surgical recovery, I was actually in the rehabilitation wing. And one night, I fell asleep. And it was interesting, because I was finally able to lay on my side. The seatbelt rupturing on my insides had caused horrible infections, and they had to stabilize. They had to leave the wounds open for weeks, even months, before I could heal. But I was finally able to sleep on my side. And my brother was there. He was teasing me because I'd laid on my back so long, the back of my head had been rubbed bald. And so he was like, you're going... And we, you know, we, he we, sounds we, like a good brother. Oh, I have the most incredible <laughs> brothers. I mean, I, I think they practically lost their jobs to be with me, but in the hospital, they'd just come and hang out because they knew I was struggling. So anyway, I fell asleep. But as I fell into a deep sleep, I felt that light again. That light came that just like at the accident, this comforting light. And what I'd been struggling with is I'd had these insights from Tamara, my wife, even in the hospital, but Griffin, my little boy, you know, I just felt nothing from him. And I thought, gosh, he was thrown from the car. What happened? And as this light came comforting me in that thought, I felt like I was rising above the hospital bed again. And then the light went away and I was in the most incredible place. I've heard heaven. I've heard the other side. I've heard the spirit world. The only word I can use that comes close is I was home. Mm. I was home. It's like I, I, I knew this place. I had been there. It was so warm and welcoming. And, I, and it was a strange, it was a very physical experience. I began running. I'd been an athlete. I had one leg now and a crushed right leg. I knew I wouldn't be running in this realm, but in that realm, I was joyfully running, thinking I'm home. And it felt so physical. And beyond physical, it felt almost sensual, like I could feel the ground under my feet and the energy charging up through my body, and I was so joyful. It was about that moment I thought, I'm not here to stay. I just knew I'm not here to stay. And there was this corridor off to the left, and I knew intuitively, oh, I'm to go down this way, which I did. I started working my way down the corridor. And as I came to the end of the corridor, there was a crib, and I raced to the crib. And when I looked in the crib, there was my little griffin, and he was sleeping as peacefully as ever, and I picked him up. Have you ever picked up a sleeping child? You know, oh, the yeah. weight and the heat of in him. It heat. was it was yeah. so physical. I could I could feel him. He was solid against me, and I, I, I could feel his breath on my neck, and I thought, he's, he's fine. He's perfectly fine. I leaned over, and I smelled his hair. That's how, you know, it was it was so real. In fact, I say, that was real. This is the weird, crazy dream, but that was real. And as I held my little boy, I felt this presence coming up behind me. And it was so powerful and so cosmic and so wise. And I began to become fearful. I'm thinking, my little boy died because I crashed the car. His life was cut short because I dozed off or lost control. Or... And this guilt was in me. And, and I, I was having this thought as this presence came closer and closer. I'm thinking, that's God. And I'm probably in trouble because I had grown up <laughs> thinking, you know, that was my, that was my, you know, life was a test and I was failing. And anyway, as this presence came closer and I'm holding my little boy just weeping and I'm having the thought, I hope I can be forgiven. And this felt physical as well. I felt these divine arms just wrap around and hold us both. That's when you say the download. It was, I was told there's nothing to forgive. Everything is in perfect divine order. And I began to see my life, the divorce of my parents, my brothers, the crash, the insecurities in me. And I was even saying, well, that was a mistake. I didn't mean, no, that was, a, well, yeah, I knew that was wrong and I did it anyway. I mean, I was justifying in this divine 
beautiful being was communicating, that's your judgment of it, not ours. We love you. You you are as beloved and divine to us as the little boy you hold in your arms. Don't you get it? You're our child. And I. it was a very personal experience. But I knew if that's true of me, that was true of all of us, of everyone. That experience in the hospital of this divine connection and perception of everyone was just flowing through me. And that was the whole point, as I was told, you designed your life for the expansion of your own soul, and we loved you enough to support it. That's our unconditional love of you. No judgment, simply love. You created a life that would give you every experience to expand your soul in the ways you wanted to. And suddenly there was this perception that life was not a test. It was actually an absolute gift that every moment of my life was a divine gift from unconditional love so that I could have the experiences I came to have. It shifted a lot of things in me. I saw on your website a photo of you with Dr. Raymond Moody. Yes, yeah. Who's famous for his, <laughs> uh, his research. Yeah. Is it interesting to you, or is it just beside the point that your experiences do kind of dovetail with many people's experience, even though they're not identical? Yeah, I, um, and I love Raymond Moody. Dr. Moody, I met him in a strange roundabout way before I had written the book, actually. Hmm. And he asked me if I'd ever had an experience, and I shared. He was another voice. It comes to me usually in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Of, <laughs> he was like, you need to write a book. And I'm like, oh, I've, you know, I don't know about that. But anyway, the research is very interesting to me, but it, it doesn't matter. Like, I have nothing to prove. We'll never prove life after death. You know, yeah. Dr. Moody is committed. He's committed his life to research. Is there really something more? Well, I already know that by my own experience, but I can't prove that to anyone else. But what I find beautiful is that regardless of all the different experiences, and there's vast and different near-death experiences, the commonality seems to be this unconditional love, this divine connection to something far greater and, and so loving. And then also, many, many from all cultures have interactions with deceased loved ones or loved ones who have passed. You know, and those are the two common grounds I see. And I think, mm. wow, it's neat to me that I'm not out on, you know, left field somewhere in my experience. But it also, to me, validates the notion that there's something more that we're connected that goes to those that go before us and even those that come after us. There seems to be a line of connection through all of our DNA, if you will, that we support each other through our experiences. Has that been difficult for you as a believing person, for instance, to go to a church service and you'll hear things taught or people's experiences that may or may not fit with your new experience? Is that something you just accept or how has that changed your feeling about organized spirituality? Yeah, it's always interesting. Yeah, I'll sit and say, well, gosh, that's not true for me. And I think what happened for me is, is my belief, my faith, if you will, was literally transformed into absolute trust. Suddenly it's like, wow, I've experienced in a very profound, intimate way the love of God. And I suppose, yeah, religion kind of, you know, sometimes it doesn't make sense, but, but love does. And yeah, and you know, I, I've been attacked saying, well, you're not, you know, you're too forgiving or there is judgment and all these things that come, but I can only share my experience and what I experienced was so absolutely unconditionally loving. I mean, there's no other word beyond it, but I honor, I honor religion. I honor all religions. You know, it's like, that's the path. I, I look at my path and had I not been in those church pews as a boy, I may not have had those insights. And that brings me to where I am now. And, and I suppose I'm more spiritual than religious but it's the ceremony and the, the processes, no matter what brand of religion you choose, are to me, they're very significant. It's what brings us closer. I've, I've studied with many religions beyond Christianity, Buddhism and Islam and, and, and even you know Hinduism and even Native American cultures. I mean, deep Celtic cultures. I was on a call yesterday with people from Scotland and Ireland that were talking about the Druids and the ancient Celtic traditions. And it all points to one thing to me, and that is that we are divine, that we truly are connected. We have far more in common as humanity than we'll ever have separate. You know, the things that still ring true to me ring true in a much louder way. When Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't spin and toil, but 
they're more magnificent than the greatest king you've known. I mean, suddenly these things become very real. It's like, yeah, I experienced that. We're the flowers. And it's our diversity. It's our uniqueness that makes us all so beautiful. And the perfection is literally within the chaos if we're open to it. There's one story I, I often share, but it was coming back home to Spencer. Gosh, if there's another hero of the story, it's my, my little son, seven years old and loses his brother, his mother, and in many ways loses his father. And I was so concerned about him. They wouldn't even allow him to see me in the hospital for some time when I was in ICU with my guts all torn open oh, and all yeah. the, you know, the ventilator. I was ventilated and, you know, big tube down my throat uh, to breathe for my lungs. But he had come and seen me in the hospital, and, and I would just cry every time I saw him. I was so concerned about him. What is his life going to be like? How is he ever going to accept this? How am I ever going to father this young mm. boy when I can't even walk? And I, I recall going home was a very profound moment. My younger brother and his wife had taken him into their home and raised him like one of their own. And I was in the hospital for almost six months. So it had been months. And I would see him periodically as the family would bring him in to visit. But now I was coming home to his turf. I mean, we were going to have to go to the grocery store and teach your parent conference. And I mean, it was, and I looked so bizarre. I mean, I had one leg cut off above the knee. My right leg was in a brace, so it stuck straight out. And then my right arm was in a brace, so it was all done up. And all I had was one left hand to drive this electric wheelchair with. And my brothers were emphatic that I become independent. No, you're going to do this on your own, you know. So, and that, that was great. That was love. But as they brought me home, it was very interesting, and, and I didn't actually go to my home. I had to go stay with my brother for another three months with home health, and they had cleared out a room and put a hospital bed in the, in the house. And Anyway, they were so supportive, but as I was coming home, I was worried about this, you know, how is Spencer going to accept this, and how am I going to be a father from a wheelchair with one working arm? And I watched as we pulled up to the house, and, and he was looking out the window, and he was watching as his uncles, my brothers, literally had to lift me out of the car and put me in the wheelchair. And, of course, my brothers are emphatic. You, you, they'd put a ramp, you know, we want you to drive into the house. <laughs> they were so good. So I'm in the chair, and he's looking out the window, and I'm thinking, how will he accept me like this? He's, you know, he's not really examined the cutoff leg and he doesn't realize all the injuries. And I had a big colostomy bag because of the, you know, the intestinal injuries. And anyway, I began to make my way to the house and he came running out and he ran toward me, but he ran right past me. He just ran right past me. And I thought, oh, I knew this was going to be so hard, you know, for him. And I continued toward the ramp and I turned to go up into the house and I I just looked over my shoulder to see where he had gone, where, where he was. And what he had actually done is he had run across the street and he was knocking on all the neighbors' doors. And he was saying, come out, come out. My dad made it home. You've got to come see my dad. And I, and I realized, wow, my, my judgments are not his judgments. And then he eventually did come and he threw himself on my lap, you know, as I sat in the wheelchair, which just about killed me because I still had all the sutures from the <laughs> abdominal, you know, recreation. And I threw my arms around him and we had a funny conversation because he was a Star Wars nut. In fact, he still is. But I said, look, they're going to they're going to fix me. I'm going to get a really cool Darth Vader leg and they're going to teach me how to walk. And we're, you know, we're going to get through this, but I'm going to be like this for a while. Are you going to be okay? And, and he's a grown man now and he's married. And I was with him last weekend, putting in a garden in his backyard. And, but what he said to me when I said, are you going to be able to get through this? He, he threw his arms around me. He said, dad, if you were nothing but a puddle of blood, I would still love you. <laughs> and, you know, and, and this is a little seven-year-old boy, right? And yet, the reason I share that, it was, it was a profound realization. I mean, I realized that here I was in a wheelchair holding my surviving son in this realm. And that was no less divine than being in the other realm holding my son that had passed in the arms of God. I mean, suddenly heaven was right here. There was, there was nowhere to go. There was nothing to become. It was simply to be in that perfect moment and realize the gift that life is and realize that love is the most powerful force in the universe. And I think it, it was his love that not only brought me back, but probably sustained me through those early mm. days and years of recovering. And uh, he's still one of my heroes. He's such a kind and compassionate man. And he, he never had an experience. He never had a dream or an out-of-body anything. You know, he, um, 
fact, he, he spoke to me about that in his young adulthood. He's like, gosh, I beat my knuckles bloody on that door. You call God and nobody ever answered. I, <laughs> you know, he, he shared, he said, I used to pray every night as a little boy to say, I just want to feel mom. I just want to feel her. And, and he said, I, I got nothing. And, and yet what he's done with that is incredible because he said, you know what, though? He said, I'll be God's love. I'll be God's arms. I'll be God's hands. I'll be the light. I'll, I'll do that for all those people that don't have the dreams or the visions or the experiences you had because he, he was, you know, he was so hungry for that as a child. So he's an incredible young man, but there's, there's gifts in life that, uh, can't be overlooked, and it's usually in the little things like that, just mm. holding my son in what, a wheelchair. What a great moment. <laughs> it was a great moment. In this, almost the last chapter of your book, you talk about, in a way, in the book, this feels like a bookend to me, like at the yeah. accident and in the hospital, your first wife yeah. having this conversation. And you had some experience, a dream maybe, that you yeah. talk about. Yeah, you know, I say dream because I don't know what word to use. I, I mean, now I might say there were visions. There's literally visions, but... If anyone's had people pass, gosh, they become our guardian angels. If we have people we love who have graduated from life, I call it, they really do look out for us. This was at a time when when life was difficult, and life is at times. There's challenges. You know, we make choices or something goes wrong or, you know, things happen. And, and I was in a pretty dark place. This was years after the accident. I had remarried. We had adopted the boys. Life was moving on. I was back to work and all the stress of raising a family and recreating a, a family and, and struggling through, you know, a second marriage. And I shouldn't say struggling, but there's challenges in all of that. And it was at that point, and, and I was really down on myself. Spencer was struggling, you know, with all that joy he had as a young man. He was he was in a rock band and, you know, some of the some of the some of the members were going to jail. There was drugs involved. It was you know, it was, it was all the all the things of life and I'm thinking I, I really messed it up. I've messed everything up. I, I haven't recovered at all. In fact, I'm worse than I was. I mean, th- this is the self talk, that defeating voice that's also in our head that always tells us we're never gonna be good enough. You know, you're never gonna make it. But it was in that dark energy that I had a dream or a vision and it was interesting because I was beating myself up. And in the dream, here comes Tamara, my my first wife, and she's joyfully dancing. You know, she came up to be dancing. She threw her arms around my neck and twirled around me. And and then it was interesting. She kissed me on the cheek. And I thought, well, that's odd. How come you wouldn't plant one right on, you know? And I'm sure she was honoring the fact that I'm married to Tanya now. I mean, she was just, it was so, there's so many levels to it. But she kissed me on the cheek and then she pulled back. And she verbally said to me with her voice and with words, she said, all that exists here is wisdom. And then she started this nonverbal communication. She looked me in the eye and she said, it doesn't matter what happened, what you did or what you didn't do or what's going on with the people around you or your concerns with the family and your children. All that matters is what you're learning. All that exists here is wisdom. And I had a verse come to me. I, I used to love a verse that, would, that said something to the effect of, cast your burdens on the Lord and I will make them light. And this is what, mm. you know, Tamara is here communicating to me. I thought light is in, oh, easier to carry. They're not as heavy. Yet what was communicated is, no, I will illuminate them to light. All the things that you're judging as struggles and downfalls and falling short literally will be transmuted into wisdom, into light. And that's the beauty of life. That's the beauty of your existence here. And, of course, I woke up from that dream or came to myself from that vision, however you want to put it. And I thought, wow, if it's all wisdom, then once again I can let go of judgments. I can learn to love unconditionally. But in this instance, it was to love myself. I had done really well at loving the homeless guy and the family and everybody around me. But, you know, in the Master's great words, love your neighbor as yourself I'd become good at loving the neighbors, but I was still not loving myself to a degree. And and I realized I can't give what I don't have. To the degree I love myself, that's what I can reflect out to others. And so that was a very profound experience. Jeff Olson is a best-selling author. He's a member of several boards doing great work around the world, very much involved in trying to make the world a better place. I'm glad to know you as a creative director here at BYU Broadcasting, the author of the book, Knowing. Jeff, thank you for speaking with me today in good faith. You're so welcome. Thank you, Steve. 
That's our time for today. Thanks to our guest, Jeffrey Olson, for generously sharing his stories and his faith. In Good Faith is committed to the idea that we all benefit from hearing people of widely varying backgrounds share their personal experience with faith and belief. In fact, we think people with such experience deserve some of our best listening. Our email, ingoodfaith at byu.edu. Twitter, at ingoodfaithbyu. In Good Faith is a production of BYU Radio. I'm Stephen Cap Perry. I hope you'll join me again soon, right here, In Good Faith.